From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. I have a call for you from Hartford. Go ahead, please. Johnny? Right here. Connors at Paramount Adjusters. Say, what was this wire, John? Are you serious about denying liability to Mrs. Henderson? I sure am. I think it'll bring the whole thing out in the open. This is pretty serious. Have you got any concrete evidence death wasn't accidental? Jim, I have a copy of the coroner's inquest. Concrete evidence that Mrs. Henderson lied under oath. She said her husband was drinking the morning he died. Everybody here believed he was a little crocked when he fell out that hotel window. I've got proof that he didn't have a drink that morning. What proof? No bottle in his room. No bottle brought there. Nothing. What do you say? Don't make a move, kiddo. I'll get the first plane. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Sheriff Holton agreed that there was enough of a doubt about the circumstances prior to George Henderson's accidental death to warrant an official re-examination of all the facts. He promised me the police would start an immediate investigation. That was all I needed. I knew Mrs. Henderson would be re-questioned and that the pressure would start to build up. Fourteen hours later, when Tim Connors arrived in Culver, I had some pressure of my own. Well, Johnny, what? Well, the best thing we can do now is move in. Deny liability on the grounds that the accident is not proved. I suppose Mrs. Henderson sues us. All right, let her. Then the burden of proving that her husband's death was accidental would be on her. Look, Tim, contrary to her testimony under oath, Henderson didn't have a drink that morning he died. All right, she made a mistake. He had a heart attack, got dizzy, and tumbled out of the window. He wasn't drunk. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Tim. Listen to me. Mrs. Henderson was ready for the coroner's jury a couple of days ago, and she was ready for my questions when I saw her yesterday. The only one she wasn't ready for was you a few days ago when you phoned her long distance. You said she hung up on you. Well, she half apologized to me for that, but it was because she couldn't think of anything to say. Well, maybe you're right. But suppose he did die accidentally, and suppose it is a just insurance claim. I tell you it isn't. Now, the fact that she made a mistake testifying about him having a drink and... Hey, Johnny, do you have anything else? Three things. Instinct, experience, and statistics. Pauline Henderson's a young woman. She married a wealthy older man. With him out of the way, she has all his money and all her youth. All right, I'm going to phone the company as soon as I can find a phone. Tell them I'm working for evidence, and the best way to get it is to bring Mrs. Henderson out in the open. File a complaint against her. What charge? Suspected murder. Oh, no, Johnny, that'd get us in all kinds of trouble. Remember the drink, Tim. Henderson didn't have the drink. Now, we'll have to have more than that. I'm sorry, Johnny. All right, I'll get you more. An hour later, I was with Sheriff Holden comparing notes. He reported that after questioning Mrs. Henderson, she admitted she might have been mistaken about Henderson drinking the morning of his death. She wasn't sure. But Eve Holton said what we both were thinking. He went in front of the coroner's jury and gave a misleading impression, son. Made us think that George was drunk and stumbled out the window. Well, we better find out who helped her pull this off. Sheriff Holton had every man in his office working on the case by then. It was a long, tedious job of combing over everything in Pauline Henderson's background to find a possible accomplice. About five in the afternoon, I drove to the Henderson Ranch with Holton. Mrs. Henderson was out, but we interviewed one of the servants. That's right, sir. Once, twice a week. Uh Uh-huh. You know where she drove to on these trips? I have no idea. Mrs. Henderson would get up early in the morning be gone all day. How do you know she went out of town? Well, she'd generally take a small suitcase with her, change her clothes. You don't take those when you're visiting a friend in town, do you? Tell us what car she'd use on these trips. A Cadillac. Always come back covered with mud and ice. Always have to be washed up. Mr. Henderson used to complain about that. About the car being dirty? Uh, About the trips, mostly. He and Mrs. Henderson had some pretty good arguments about him. He'd say Mrs. Henderson shouldn't visit that man. What man? Just that man. I never knew who it was they argued about. You've known Mrs. Henderson quite a long time, huh? Yes, sir. Know her when she was a little girl, when she first came here. Saw her grow up, go away to school, go away to Europe. Come back a little more grown up and a little different every time. 
Were you surprised when Mr. Henderson married her? Well, no. Well, yes, guess I was. Because she was so much younger? Not that so much. I mean, well, Mr. Henderson, he had something about the plains and cattle and mountains about him. When he moved, it was as big as all them things. And Mrs. Henderson was different. She didn't fit in here? Is that what you're trying to say? I think she fit. Not like him, though. Before they were married, they were sort of like good friends. I mean, they'd ride horses and go hunting and laugh and talk about different things. Mrs. Henderson, she traveled to Europe, saw so many things and places in the world. She fit here, but then she didn't belong here. I feel awful about Mr. Henderson's being dead. If there was anything wrong with the way he died, I'd like it to be fixed. Mrs. Henderson will probably fire me for talking like this, but I don't care. This house isn't the same no more. By the time we got back into town, Sheriff Holden's boys had discovered the names of three men who had been seen at various places around Culver in the company of Mrs. Henderson. Rod Tyler. Oh, who's he? Mining engineer. He's been away from here for over a year now. See, now, here's another one, Sam Pollard. Sam died six months ago. Hey. What? Noah Baxter. Noah Baxter. That name's vaguely familiar. Yeah, he owns a hotel you're staying in. A couple of ranches, too. Well, he might have been the one who tried to have you thrown out. Oh. He also owns the mayor. Young man? About 30, 35. Let's go see him. Another drive, this time north of Culver to the Baxter Ranch. We found Noah Baxter busy with his help shoring horns on cattle. A lean, tall man with thin features. If you're trying to find out if I've been seeing Pauline on the sly while she'd been married to George, why didn't you come right out and ask? All right, have you? No, not on the sly. There's nothing between us. George knew any time she came over here to see me. He was a good friend of mine. I'm sorry he's dead. Pauline's a good friend of mine, too. I'm sorry you people are thinking what you are about us. Let's go up the house. It's getting cold. All right, Stan, that's enough for today. No, I got to ask you this. Where were you last Thursday? The day George died, Sheriff? Yeah. I was right here. Can you prove that? <laughs> sure. Ask anybody. You boys want a drink? No, thanks. Right. No. Well, I do. Mac! Mac! I didn't get it myself. When was the last time you were in cover, Mr. Baxter? Three, four weeks ago. My cook and the others handle what supplies we need. Do you mind if we talk to some of your help around here? No. Nope. What do you want to talk to him about? About last Thursday? About what happened when Mrs. Henderson came here to visit? It wouldn't look good if she came here to visit me, would it? Well, that depends on the circumstances, no? Huh. Well, she'd come and sit there and read and look at some of those paintings. We'd talk when I had time. Anything wrong with that? No. Mr. Baxter, I think I ought to tell you. I've asked my company to file a complaint against Mrs. Henderson. Suspicion of murder. Oh. I'd like to tell you something. She didn't kill him and she didn't have him killed. She loved him a lot more than George loved her, I think. Both of you know her. Her dad was a drunken cowhand. When he died, George took her over, gave her everything. So you see, you're wrong. She loved George for giving her what he gave her and mostly for being the kind of a man he was. I lied to you a couple of minutes ago. There was something between us. It was bound to happen sooner or later. She'd come here to cry on my shoulder and... I... I let her. Cry? About George. He wanted to divorce her. Didn't you know that? I had the idea it was the other way around. Oh, you're all wrong. George raised her, educated her, made her into a woman, and then he married her. And she wasn't what he wanted at all. Do you know who George wanted to marry? Matty Knickerbocker, the schoolmaster. Come on. Oh, there was nothing between George and Maddie, but there would have been if he'd lived. What about you and Mrs. Henderson? Yeah. Now, the thing that was between us was that I wanted her. 
She didn't want me, but I wanted her. I was glad when she told me about the divorce coming up. I really think she would have listened to me. But she wanted to be married to George. She really loved him. Sure you don't want one of these? No. No. And I really loved her. I went to see George last Thursday at his hotel. You know why? To tell him to go back to Pauline. Yeah, because I knew what he meant to her. <laughs> you can talk to my people around here. They'd lie for me and say I was here last Thursday all day. They'd tell you that Pauline never came to see me. They'd lie right down the line for me. But, Mr. Dollar, I can't let you get out that complaint and take her in. One of my trucks was taking some beef to the hotel last Thursday. I rode in with the driver and went in the back way. I went right up to George's room to talk to him. Pauline had just left. I wanted to talk to him about the same things I've been telling you. I didn't want to hurt him. I loved him, the same as everybody loved him. When I got to his room, he wouldn't let me talk at all. He was mad that I interfered. He tried to swing on me. I shoved him once. He went out the window. That's all. I killed him. Expense account, item eight. $58.15, hotel and food while in Culver, Montana. Item nine, same as item two, transportation by train and plane back to Hartford. Item 10, $88, miscellaneous. Expense account total... $802.50. Remarks? We still had to pay double indemnity. Maddie Knickerbocker, Pauline Henderson, Noah Baxter, they'll pay another way. With the hurt that comes to nice people. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story beginning next Monday night. Next week, a real mystery complete with plenty of action, a beautiful blonde, and a killer lurking in the shadows. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Irene Tedrow, D.J. Thompson, Herb Ellis, Marvin Miller, Forrest Lewis, Bob Bruce, and Russ Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story... Of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>